If you want to capture amazing astrophotography images in 2020, whether that's a wide angle Milky Way photo or a deep space object, then you need to capture a lot of light. And this is a very simple concept, but a lot of people tend to overlook it. And I want to break down some of the problems I faced over the past couple years doing astrophotography and how I took things to the next level. So this photo here was taken a couple years ago with my Nikon D750. These camera settings were f2.8, 15 seconds, ISO 6400. And a lot of beginners tend to freak out about the ISO. What ISO should I use? What ISO? But they don't spend enough time thinking about how much light they should be capturing. And to be clear, the ISO never changes the amount of light coming into the camera. It essentially just brightens the image. That's really all it's doing. So this first photo here, if I increase the exposure and the shadows, you see this purple glow here? This was pretty much baked into every single photo I used to take at night, and it drove me crazy. I couldn't figure out how to fix it, how to stop it from happening, and that's why a lot of my earlier photos had kind of a unique color scheme because that was the only way I could find to minimize this purple glow and stop it from detracting from my overall photo. And then about two years ago, I found a very simple solution and it's really changed everything. And all that I have to do is capture more light. And the best way to demo that is with probably this set of images here. This is a 20 second long photo, ISO 6400, f2.8. And if I increase the exposure and the shadows again, you'll notice that same purple glow. And if we zoom in here, there is a ton of grain all throughout the photo. And this is what a lot of people's images look like. You'll even notice some color model. That's this weird splotchy greens and purples. So if you're only capturing 30 seconds or less of light, and the main reason you do that is to make sure your stars are sharp, you're never going to get a great photo because you didn't capture enough light to really take a good look at this photo and then watch what happens when I take a four minute long photo. It's actually a little bit longer, but still drives the point home. Look how much cleaner the foreground is. There's no purple glow and the image just looks so much better. So there's 20 seconds versus about four minutes. And if I zoom in here to the car, you can even see the hubcap details. There's no real grain anymore. And there's a little bit. There's none of that splotchy colors that you can really see. There's a few hot pixels, but those aren't a real big deal. And if we compare that to the 20 second long photo, look how terrible that is. You can't even make out the H there for Honda. And there it's crystal clear. And I think this image really just drives home that point where if you take longer exposures, your photos are just gonna look so much better and it's gonna change everything. Now I'm sure you're immediately thinking, well, wait a minute, the stars are blurry. What are you gonna do about that? And that's where a star tracker comes in. And this is why I've been so passionate about star trackers over the past few years and I've pretty much done everything around a star tracker because when you're able to take longer exposures, it just changes everything. So the way a star tracker works is you just point it up to the North Star basically. That's where all the stars appear to rotate around. And to be clear, it's the Earth rotating, but anyway, once you point the star tracker up to that spot in the sky, you turn it on, you can attach your camera, and now your camera is going to follow the motion of the stars. So when you do that, you can take a four or five minute long photo and the stars will be sharp. The only problem is now your foreground is going to blur out. So what you can do is you can come back here, you can take your four minute long photo for the foreground, the stars blur out, but that's okay. Then we'll take our tracker, turn it on, and then we'll get a four minute long photo for the stars. Now the stars are nice and sharp, and then we could take the two, blend them together, and create a stunning image. And that's really the secret to creating breathtaking astrophotography images, whether it's wide angle or deep space. But one of the main points I want to touch on this video is that a little while ago, probably a couple months, I asked for people to send in some images of their cameras so I can do some tests. And I finally have the data for those tests that I can share with you guys today. And it's, we've kind of already touched on it, but let's look at a Nikon D750. This is what we call a dark frame, where we just put the lens cap on the front of the lens, make sure no light reaches the sensor. In this case, uh, the person took a 300 second long photo, ISO 200. I want you to be clear here, the settings really don't matter for this test if you want to do it, and I recommend you do. All you have to do is put the lens cap on the front of your camera, put the camera to manual mode, 
throw a shirt or a towel over the camera, and then take anywhere from a one second to a 30 second to a four minute long photo. Again, ISO, aperture, shutter speed, doesn't really matter. Once you have that dark photo, bring it in here to camera raw or Lightroom, and then increase the exposure and the whites. And when you do that, you're gonna see the problems that are ultimately gonna manifest in your photos if you don't capture enough light. That's really what's going on. So we see that same purple glow. So this is a, another person's D750. If we compare that with mine though, pretty much the same problem. Both cameras have that same purple glow, although there are some differences. And that's the thing, you might have three or four of the same exact camera, but none of them are gonna perform exactly the same. And you really gotta test out your own camera rather than just relying on whatever I show you to make sure your camera is performing correctly. And with that in mind, of all the photos I got in, it was actually a Canon 6D that looked the best. So if I'd stretch this out, ignore the green and the grain and everything, I want you to look at the overall flatness of the image, if you will. There's no bright areas and dark areas. It's just pretty neutral all the way across. I mean, there's a little bit of bright around the corners, but this is a very good sensor from the looks of it. And let me show you what a bad sensor looks like so you can kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. This is a, a Canon 5D Mark III, and this is still the ugliest thing I've ever seen when it comes to photography. And it caused us no end of problems. I was working with a student, and this sensor, the problems in that photo were baked into the photos that we took. So this is a photo we took uh, earlier in the night with that same camera. And what you'll notice is that there's the Veil Nebula there, this had the potential to be a great photo, but look at all this color grain here and the hot pixels. I mean, it looks absolutely disgusting. And if you look right here, see how it's kind of unnaturally bright? We see the exact same thing in the dark frame. And over here, it's oddly dark. We see the same thing in the actual photo. We even see the glowing corners. So my point with this is if you go and take that dark frame, Again, the settings really aren't important, just make sure no light reaches the sensor. Whatever problems you see here are gonna manifest in your photos, especially if you don't capture enough light. And in this case, we captured a lot of light, 240 seconds at f5.6, that's pretty darn good. But that just goes to show you, if your camera is not up to the task, you're gonna be in for a lot of nightmares uh, over the next couple months and years. But if you had like a Canon 6D, this very specific Canon 6D, there's no bright areas, there's no dark areas. I unfortunately don't have a, an image taken of the night sky with it, but I can guarantee you it's gonna work a lot better than this 5D Mark III. Now, if you've been doing astrophotography for a little while now, you've probably heard about dark frames in bias frames. Everybody online is gonna tell you that you need to take darks in bias and then stack those to reduce things like hot pixels and noise and even some of this banding. So I wanted to test that out and show you what I found because I always like to do things my own way and I usually get a lot of crap for it, but we'll see exactly what happens. And one other thing I wanna show you is that the past few nights uh, we've been having a workshop and there've just been tons and tons of satellites, I believe there's satellites, going through our images just one after the other. It was like a stream and I think this is Starlink, but it's kind of shocking. i would never saw anything like this before until this year. So that's one of the downsides of Elon Musk putting all these satellites in the sky, which I'm pretty sure that's what this is. If you know more, leave a comment, let me know. Anyway, going back to our main point here, this is a single 90 second photo. And for the workshop, uh, he took about 30 or 40 images, one after the other. Then what we did is we used uh, two different applications actually. First, we used Sequitor. So if you're still a beginner, this is a free application that's gonna stack all your images to reduce grain. So we can double click on star images, find all of our, what we call light frames. These are all the photos of Orion. The more the better, we load those in. And then we're gonna add in our dark frames where it says noise images. Just to recap, dark frames are taken at the end of the night. You want the camera sensor to be the same temperature, so leave it outside, put the lens cap on, use all the same camera settings and try and take as many as you can. Usually the more the better. And again, we're gonna load up all of our darks. In this case, we actually had more darks than star images just because uh, some frost started to get on the lens and it ruined some shots. 
but then we would stack these all together. So let me show you the results of those tests. And we have, this is kind of the way I do things. I only stack the light frames because frankly, I think dark frames are a waste of time. Now when we stretch this, you'll notice that the image is fairly clean now. There's some color noise there because these were raw photos that were stacked together. But there's a lot of nice detail there in the Orion Nebula. The problem starts to show up though when we stretch the image more. And you might see it now, there's that same banding. We have a big purple band here, this kind of a yellowish one. And that matches exactly with his dark frames that we took. So here's his dark frame. You'll see there's kind of like a yellow band there and a really noticeable purple one. And if we look back at our stacked light frames, the bands line up exactly. And that might be kind of hard to see here, but uh, they're definitely there. So again, what everybody online is gonna tell you, you don't wanna just stack light frames, you wanna add in those darks, which I just showed you. But this is the result of that. And when we stretch this, we'll see the exact same problem. So hopefully you can see there's this big purple band here. There's two more below it. And then we have that yellow one there going across. So keep your eye on the big purple one there and the yellow one. I'm going to go back to the dark frame and they line up exactly. So even though we took dozens and dozens of light frames and even dozens of dark frames and stacked them together, these problems are still baked into the photo. And then that brings up the final thing, bias frames. These are allegedly supposed to fix these problems as well. So we used an application called Deep Sky Stacker. This is another free download for Windows. And we added in our light frames, dark frames, and bias frames. I'm not gonna get into how to do that today because as you'll see, I think it's a waste of time for DSLRs anyway. And when we come back here, this was the final stack out of Deep Sky Stacker. And you can see it looks terrible, which means we have a lot of work to do in Photoshop to get this to a presentable image. And in fact, I can't even really stretch it the way I need to to demo for this video, but I did it off camera and I found that the bands were still here even when we added in the bias frames. So I just wanted to be thorough here and say, even if you include bias with your darks, for those who know what I'm talking about, in my experience, it doesn't help with DSLRs and banding. So if you want to do your own test and maybe send those in and prove me wrong. I'd like to see it because I can't seem to get it to work. But my main point with this little tangent is that, you know, for a lot of people with DSLRs, dark frames and bias frames, they're not going to fix the worst offending problems that you'll find baked in your images. So they're really a waste of time and energy. The best thing you can do is take longer exposures. And as I showed you, when you take longer exposures, it's gonna automatically remove that in most cases. And that's always gonna give you the best results. And one of the problems we have with deep space astrophotography in particular is that it's very hard to shoot uh, long exposures when we're using a telephoto lens. And that's where you need to get into like auto guiding and things like that. If you're still beginning and just focusing on wide angle nightscapes, don't even worry about auto guiders. But if you kinda know what I'm talking about, I got plenty of videos on that here on YouTube, so be sure to check out my auto guider videos because that's going to ultimately give you better results if you can shoot longer exposures rather than taking all those dark frames and spending all that extra time. And there's one other example I want to show you. This was sent in as part of the group project, and this was the original photo somebody sent in. They took it with an ADD from Canon, and they already did all the stacking ahead of time, so they stacked in their bias and darks, I believe. But when I stretched the image, we see the exact same problem. This is a different camera, but the Canon cameras, as we talked about, tend to have serious banding issues. And even though he stacked everything the way they tell you online, it did not remove this problem. Let me show you another example. So we have a 7D Mark II here, and this was a 20 second long exposure. The sky is fairly bright, but the foreground is very dark. As I increase the exposure and the shadows, you might notice if you look very clear, uh, closely here, we have some more banding going on. You see that band, band. Now if we take a look at his dark frame here, what a surprise, we see some banding, just like we saw in the normal photo. And I hope you're starting to grasp this concept now because this is so important. When you take your dark frames, 
whatever problems you see here, they're gonna show up in your photos if you don't capture enough light. And that's the same thing we saw with my images at the start of the video. This is a dark frame for my camera. We have the purple glow. It's the same purple glow we see in my er earlier photos because I didn't capture enough light. But once I stopped taking 20 or 30 second long exposures and took four minute long exposures, the problem disappeared. And there's one other example I wanna show you from my camera. This was a 15 second exposure taken in arches. It's a dark silhouette, but maybe I wanna get some more detail out of it. If I pull it up, there's that darn purple glow again. But if I just take a four minute long photo now, look how clean that is. And that looks almost like we took it during the day just because I captured a lot more light. Now again, the only downside with this method is that you have to blend in the sky. So that's where you get your star tracker, take a four minute long photo with a star tracker, and then especially with this photo, you can blend it in in about three seconds because there's a clean horizon. If you wanna learn how to blend all this, be sure to check out my courses available on my website. I've also got a Patreon page where we go into all this. I do new videos every month, but it really takes some practice to get the processing down. But the first step is just getting the good data out of your camera to start with. And finally, let's look at one other series of photos. This is a Nikon D7200, and you'll probably notice a familiar problem. We have a purple glow. And again, I wanna thank everybody who sent in those photos because it really allowed me to determine what's going on. It seems like the Nikon cameras are very prone to this purple, I would kinda of call it amp glow, but the Canon cameras tend to have problems with banding. And this is the EOS R. You can kind of see some banding there, although I really like the EOS R, it's a good camera. Uh, but if we take a look, again, there's that 70 Mark II right here. A lot of banding. There was also a 5D Mark IV, which is like their premier camera, but we see the same banding problem. Point being, whatever problems you see in your dark frame, they're more than likely eventually gonna show up in your normal photos at night unless you take longer exposures, as I showed you right here. That was the original and after. All right, well, I think I've droned on long enough in this video. Just to recap, if you wanna start taking better images in 2020, first thing I'd recommend is taking longer exposures, capturing more light. When you do that, you're gonna pull out a lot more detail. You're gonna pretty much get rid of all that grain in your photos and probably hide that purple glow if you're on Nikon or some of that banding if you're on Canon. And the big trick to taking things to the next level is a star tracker. So if you wanna learn more, I got tons of videos here on YouTube, I got my Patreon page, and I've also got full courses on my website which are really in depth. There's like 15 some hours in each one. That's the way to go if you're just uh, getting started. But that's all I got for you today. If you have a question, you can leave a comment. And my real big takeaway is that you should go grab your camera right now, take a dark frame, just throw a shirt or something over it, put the lens cap on. Settings really aren't important. We just need to capture the sensor essentially. Then bring it in here in the camera raw or Lightroom, bring up the exposure and the whites. Whatever problems you see here, again, they're probably gonna show up in your photos. So ideally, you have something nice and flat like this 6D. And now that we're looking at this for the last time, you're starting to understand why this looks so good. It doesn't have banding, it doesn't have bright spots, and it doesn't have my infamous purple glow. So that's kind of what we're looking for out of a camera. I guess that's why a lot of people like the 6D for Astro. But uh, if you do these tests, you'll quickly see how your camera is gonna do in low light scenarios.